um, Bragg um, was born in Australia, in Adelaide, uh, counted himself br British, um, and he was an expert, above all, on how to use x-rays to study the structure of crystals and of uh, nuclei. Bragg arrived as head of the Cavendish lab in the late 1930s, in 1937. And um, rather like J.J. Thompson and very much unlike uh, Rutherford, Bragg's genius, I think, as laboratory director was to spot who amongst his young associates was asking the most interesting questions and what new kinds of science the lab should in encourage. And the two great achievements, really, of Bragg's period are utterly surprising for what had been, for 70 years, the world's leading physics lab. On the one hand, Bragg understood extremely well how the techniques of X-ray crystallography could be used much more widely. So X-ray crystallography is, in principle, simple and, in fact, immensely complicated. It is based on the principle that um, electromagnetic radiation of very high frequency, so very low wavelength, um, will be scattered and diffracted by structures whose spacing, whose orderly spacing, is comparable with the tiny wavelengths of that radiation. That means crystals. So you could treat a crystal as a kind of diffraction grating, and you could determine the structure of a crystal by observing and capturing, photographically typically, the diffraction patterns when you fired x-rays. The master of this technique was a man whom Bragg and Rutherford both loathed. He was called J.D. Bernal. He was a communist, visionary, socialist activist, anti-war campaigner, founder of the Cambridge Scientists Anti-War Group during the Spanish Civil War. He helped organize a model of a Basque village to be built on King's Parade and then blew it up to show Cambridge Dons what the effects of fascist attacks in the Spanish Civil War were. Bernal was also a womanizer, a hedonist, interested in art and architecture, a friend of Gropius and Mahoyinage, um, utterly unlike the, it must be confessed, extremely Philistine Rutherford and the slightly genteel, although Australian, Bragg. When Bragg became head of the Cavendish, Bernal left Cambridge for London and became head of the crystallography lab down at Birkbeck. This left exactly one person in the whole of the Cavendish who was nearly as good at using these techniques to look at biological crystals, and his name was Max Perutz. He was a refugee from what had become fascist Austria. Um, Rutherford and then Bragg were instrumental in trying to get scientists out of Nazi Europe to safety in Britain and North America. It's one of their greatest achievements, and Perutz was exactly such a refugee. And Perutz was an extraordinary man. He was single-minded to an amazing degree, and he realized just before the beginning of World War II, so 1937 through to 39, and then beyond, that you could use X-ray crystallographic, X-ray diffraction techniques to, to describe the structure of the vast organic molecules that control the processes of life, proteins, hemoglobin, and so on. During the war, and just after 45 to 47, the group that Perutz was running consisted of exactly two people, Perutz and the amazing and very bright young John Kendrew. That was it. And Bragg, and it's an astonishing fact, instantly recognized that this is the future. And he did what Cambridge Dons do when they want money. He went to dine at the Athenaeum and had lunch with uh, the head of the Medical Research Council and managed to get just enough money out of the MRC to set up a unit within the Cavendish to use the X-ray techniques to describe the vast organic molecules on which life processes depend. And that rapidly expanded through the late 40s and into the early 50s, from two to about 45. In the early 50s, 
it recruits Francis Crick and then the young American um, Jim Watson and in 1953, very much with Bragg's blessing and with Perutz and Kendrew's encouragement, these two young men using um, both the kind of molecular biological techniques developed here, but above all, as we now know, using the um, X-ray photos of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which had been made not here, but in London, at King's College London, by Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, who were disciples of Bernal, they construct a molecular description of DNA, the famous double helix model. The myths about this story are all very well known, mainly thanks to Jim Watson's book, The Double Helix, which came out in the early 60s, and perhaps we shouldn't dwell on them here. But what is so striking is that this, the greatest discovery in biology of the 20th century, um, emerges from a physics lab and is incomprehensible without the very long tradition of practical engagement, model building, photography, manipulation of high energy radiation, which is characteristic of this institution, right? and thence molecular biology. A similar story can be told about the basement here. Our final story. Um, in a very similar way, uh, Bragg quickly recognized the immense scientific uh, advances and significance of the work that had been done in the Second World War around radar, the telecommunications establishments, which had helped win the war for Britain. And radio engineers, especially those working around radar, notably J.A. Ratcliffe and his assistant Martin Ryle, had used radar technology and radio detection technologies to begin to explore radio waves arriving on, on Earth at Earth from deep space. So in the 1940s, again, I don't think this involved dinner at the Athenaeum, but it involved something very similar, uh, Bragg managed to raise just enough money to set up what is essentially the first British radio observatory here. And during the 50s and 60s, again, not at all ceiling wax and string, but very sophisticated, very high tech, precision engineering, radio de detection, um, Ryle and his colleagues, Ratcliffe and his colleagues, um, begin to link together theoretical models of the universe and star formation with radio de detection. One of the more interesting questions that they were looking at was what are called quasi-stellar objects, quasar as we now call them. And the problem was that there, it was proposed by theory, by cosmological theory, that there must be tiny, tiny, tiny objects in deep space which seem to behave like stars but are much smaller than stars. So they're generating the amount of electromagnetic radiation, so the amount of energy that a whole sun generates, but they must be much smaller. And Hewish worked out a possible way of spotting these in terms of radio detection, radio astronomy detection, which is essentially looking for the ones that twinkle a lot. Right? It's a wonderful idea. So scintillation. Right? In the optical wavelengths, we see stars twinkling. And we see them twinkling because the light that reaches us from the stars has to pass through the Earth's atmosphere. So I call that scintillation. Right? In the radio part of the spectrum, objects in deep space twinkle, and they twinkle because of the vast clouds of charged particles around our sun. And the smaller they are for constant energy, the more they twinkle. So if you could spot a, a radio source that was scintillating a lot, then it was probably a quasar, a tiny but star-like object. So Hewish and his team, especially his research student, Jocelyn Bell, um, working here, under Bragg's and then uh, Neville Mott's patronage in the mid-1960s, um, began a survey of bright, twinkling radio sources. And in 1967, the summer of 1967, when most people in Cambridge were doing something completely different, though at least as celestial, um, Bell uh, began to spot extraordinary phenomena, which were stars' radio sources that were producing 
pulses at amazingly regular, but amazingly short intervals of slightly under two seconds. So this is something that is immensely distant, but is producing something that reaches us with a period like that. And the first one that they spotted, the most obvious hypothesis was that this was a radio signal from intelligent source, what they called in those days an LGM, a little green man. So there was a brief, very brief period when perhaps this was going to be extraterrestrial life. But once Jocelyn Bell discovered another one in a completely different part of the sky with a very similar period, she realized that no LGMs could be involved because it would be completely bizarre if two groups of extraterrestrials were both signaling on this rather strange frequency with exactly the same period, both directed at Earth. That seemed unlikely. And the culmination of the story, again, I think, emphasizes something that the whole story of Cavendish science brings out. The intimate relation between experiment and theory, without which these triumphs can't be achieved. There was then a very intense debate involving Hewish and Bell and Fred Hoyle at the Institute of Astronomy, probably one of the greatest theoretical cosmologists of the, of the period, and Tommy Gold, who very quickly established that um, these must be neutron stars. These pulsars are what's left after a supernova. You have extraordinarily dense, I mean, hyper hyper dense neutron stars, and as they spin, they emit radiation. And the period of the pulse shows you how tiny, how unbelievably tiny, the uh, neutron star must be because it's producing a pulse once every just under two seconds from immensely far away. For pulsars, uh, Hewish won the Nobel Prize. There's been a great debate about this. Uh, should not Jocelyn Bell, who was the observer in question, have won the prize? Fred Hoyle, as was his wont, tough, pugnacious, genial Yorkshireman, said it was an outrage that Jocelyn Bell hadn't got the prize. Um, that's become, as in the Rosalind Franklin case, an issue of debate ever since. Um, so the story continues, but in terms of West Cambridge, that's really uh, a different story. We would have to go to a different building. In 1975, the scientists moved out of these buildings to a glamorous new set of buildings in the western part of town, something much more industrial and factory-like than this conjurie of Gothic, modern, and postmodern architecture. And they were replaced by the social scientists. Um, by the historians of science, the social anthropologists, the sociologists, uh, the people who work around Africa, and so on. The mercury under the floorboards had to be pumped out, the background radiation reduced, and history moved on. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that uh, place matters. It seems to me that the intimacy of theoreticians, experimenters, students and technicians in what now looks to us to be extraordinarily crowded accommodation with techniques and ideas being very rapidly circulated across disciplinary boundaries. I mean, this is a story that starts with uh, electromagnetism and the ohm and telegraphy and ends with pulsars and DNA uh, from the 1870s to the 1960s is a story in which disciplines are more often obstacles than resources. It's not a story of sealing wax and string. It's not a story of institutional poverty. It is a story of, I think, a kind of triumphant scientific geography.